Hi, this is Neil with Rock Our World. I'm going to have a bit of a medley of things to cover today. This is the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, which is October 8th. I know that doesn't match up with the Jewish calendar, but the, the Jewish people use a man-made calendar made by the rabbis and what is called the Sanhedrin is the modern-day uh, face of what Yeshua, Jesus, confronted the Pharisees and the Sadducees in his day. The same group of evil people where it says in the churches who say they are Jews and are not. That's a little bit uh, hard to understand because of our paradigms. I ran that past my wife and she said, I don't, I don't follow what you're saying. Well, I said, it's the same thing as a person saying they're crisp a Christian, but they don't follow the teachings of Christ. So uh, Judaism would be the same thing. If you say you're a Jew, but don't follow the teachings that are found in the Torah, the prophets, and the writings, then you're, you're that's what uh, Yeshua meant when he said, they say they're a Jew, but they are not. They're liars. And in essence, the vast majority of Christians and Jewish people are liars because they do not follow the teachings. The Christians do not follow the teachings of Yeshua, who said very clearly, if you break the least commandment of the Torah and teach others to do the same, you will be called least in the kingdom. And he also said that if you say, Lord, Lord, but do not do as I say, and in fact, go to the point of emulating Jesus Christ. Emulate means to do what he did. And uh, we come up with all kinds of excuses why we don't follow this law or that law or, or teaching and instruction is really what Torah means. The Jewish people are in the same boat. If they simply go to the synagogue and listen to the teachers, they will not be getting the word of God. They proclaim that they follow the Torah, the prophets, and the writings, but they do not. They follow the teachings of men. But if they dig into their scriptures, which we have the same ones, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings, they will find that they're not being taught properly, as is and are Christians and Christianity. We are the two houses of Israel, and we have... Uh, grossly, we are grossly missing the mark. I had mentioned this last video that the, the Hebrew language, each letter has a meaning so that when a, a word is put together, it actually tells a story. You take each letter, uh, letter and, and uh, look at what each one says and see what it, the word says. The word Torah is made up of, I think it's three letters, I'm not a Hebrew expert, but its story or its message is to aim and hit the mark. That's what Torah means, the letters when put together. And the, I think again, three letters for sin means to aim and miss the mark. And that's why it says in 1 John 3, 4, sin is the transgression of the Torah. So if you uh, break e any uh, teaching and instruction found within the Torah, then you are sinning. And there isn't a Christian group on the face of this earth that will teach that because there's not a Christian group on the face of the earth that believes it and does it. So they don't refer, when they're talking about sin, which we hear lots about. We were just at a conference this weekend and I dare say the word sin was brought up 50 to 100 times and not once was the different definition brought up. Sin is the transgression of the Torah. Nor was Matthew 5, 17 to 19, where Yeshua said, if you break the least commandment of the Torah, and there's about 600 of them, then you are sinning. Or you will be called, if you break the least one and teach others to do the same, you will be called least in the kingdom of God. So we have a lot on the line for following the teachings of men, 
which you will find in the, in the churches and the synagogues. But if you go into your cave out in the desert, that's where God's true uh, leaders are being trained, you will go into your scriptures, the Torah, the prophets and the writings, and then you will find, once you translate the apostolic writings properly, there is zero evidence that Yeshua came to do away with the law. So, that's quite a journey to take on, and the Lord has left a lot of it to this very late hour. Exactly why he's done it this way. Uh, you know, you could, you could look at the whole thing and say the Lord could very easily remove Satan from the scene. He's the deceiver of mankind, but uh, he's not, so why? And it leads you to one of the conclusions that God is not looking to save everybody. That is definitely his objective in the end, and I believe he will achieve his objective once the full plan has gone through, right through the thousand years and into the time of the new heavens and the new earth. Right now, he's looking for his first fruits, and they come in three categories. The least, or not least, <laughs> the greatest one, which is the smallest group, is called the bride, and she will be revealed very soon. Uh, listen to the last 10 to 15 messages that Julie Wedby has been given. She has quite a focus on the bride, or the Lord gives her messages, focusing on the bride. and. Uh, if you're computer challenged like I am, the best way to get her most current messages is, is go to I Am Calling You Now blog on one of the internet search engines like Google or, or Internet Explorer. And there's another one that I'm not thinking of right now. So um, what we're finding is that the Lord is putting together his bride right now, and it is a growing con consensus that uh, the 144,000 are the bride, and they are, they are picked strictly from the descendants of the house of Israel. And that doesn't mean it's barred to so-called Gentiles. But remember what a Gentile is in Hebrew is goyim, and it means separated from God. So um, Gentiles are and always have been welcomed into the camp of Israel, but you stop being a Gentile when you start following God's teachings and instructions. And that's the process. And they don't have a different set of rules. They just have a, a beginning like everybody else. You have to start somewhere. So in Exodus, when it says there's a mixed multitude came with the people, they were given three three uh, instructions to start with and the same thing in when we read in the apostolic writings the meeting at Jerusalem they made a decision what are we going to tell these new converts or where, where to start their walk you have to look past the paradigms and realize they're they're not being told they only have to follow three rules for the rest of their lives that's where they start because that's their biggest challenge at that point so anyway, you can go look in the story of Exodus and in the story of Acts and find out what those uh, beginner's rules were and realize that we're all the same. We are being asked to keep all of the rules, the teachings and instructions, every last one of them. There's about 600 of them. And we can't possibly know them and keep them all in one step. So that's why the Lord starts uh, somewhere. He he will talk to you in your heart. For me, this happened 43 years ago. I walked into a service with my, my wife-to-be, my bride, my girlfriend. She wanted me to go to church. I walked into that auditorium. Actually, it was a school gym in Regina, Saskatchewan. O'Neill High School gym. And uh, there was about 300 people there, and I was com completely convicted of the sin that I was indulging in. That's a sin of thievery. I was a thief. I was stealing money from my customers. 
and the Lord convicted me of that sin when I walked into that building. And I didn't realize it till some years later, but that's the first time I heard God's voice very clearly. Neil, I want you to stop sinning. And then uh, it came to my understanding in the course of time that he had a job for me to do. And these 43 years since, I've been learning more and more about my job. And in these past three years, part of it is doing these YouTubes. So I better get on to what I'm here for. This medley of topics, but I'm going to focus more on the festivals, the fall festivals. But first, I'm going to get the closest. I I had a, a uh, viewer ask me, why do we never see my wife? So I asked her if she would come on and share, but she so far has declined. But here's her latest book, Crossing the Line. Get this right. It is focused on leadership. If you think you're a leader, believe you're a leader, this is a very good book for you to read. And there's there's my dear wife right there. Get this right. And uh, just a point, the lady who painted this picture, Cherry Top, is in need of prayers. Uh, or could use your prayers. She's uh, suffering from cancer, and as many, many people are, and though we want to make sure we ask what God's will is in everything, uh, if she could be delivered from that disease, we'd ask you to join us. But anyway, Cherry uh, quickly put together that simplistic picture, and that was by choice and design of a group of us, mostly my wife, but uh, she wanted something very simple. You see there was a cross there and there was the dark side and the light side. And it reminds me of the challenge that Abraham was given. He was the first Hebrew. Hebrew means to cross over. The Lord said, Abraham, I want you to leave everything you have here, where you live, your family, your, your surroundings, your everything you're familiar with and go to a place I will show you. That's quite a challenge. And I'm going to show you a book that I've shown you before, The Pearl. This is the first book my wife wrote and uh, that picture was painted by my our daughter, Rochelle. And there's another picture of my dear wife. So, so far that's the closest we're going to get to, to uh, meeting my wife. And you can visit, uh, she does have a, a YouTube, no, um, what do you call it, a website called Wells of Restoration, but she hasn't done a lot of work on it. But she's in the process of writing four more books. They're at various stages and exactly what their names will be. She thinks one will be called I Do, focused on marriage. Anyway, those I call these uh, books uh, a gentle introduction to the true ways of the Lord which are not taught by the Christian and Jewish churches. So we beat that one up enough. It's a very difficult thing to let go of our paradigms and if you refuse, if any of us refuses to continue to grow, that is reassess our theology and remove the pieces that are wrong, then we have dropped out of the race. So that's an encouragement to never stop growing. Never, ever stop growing. Never, ever get to the place where you won't allow your theology be to be challenged. And that the most important step in theology is reading the scriptures. The second one is asking the Holy Spirit to explain it, not men, sent from Bible schools and yeshivas, or ladies. And then uh, the third one is to walk out what you're learning. So now I'm going to switch to one of those very important topics, the appointed times of the Lord. That's one of the things the Lord has asked all of us to do, and neither Christians nor Jews do it. 
the Jewish people come a little bit closer, but they use a man-made calendar to find the festivals. And they um, don't read the scriptures, so then they don't check it out. And this is generalizing, of course. And Christians are the same. We don't keep any of God's appointed times, but rather we keep a whole bunch of pagan rooted festivals and we again don't bother reading the scriptures to check things out so the festivals are extremely important because they teach us the entire plan of god the entire plan of god is wrapped up in keeping these nine appointed times each one has a focused revelation and i don't know it all yet but i keep learning year by year by year and i teach what i feel i learn and there's, of course, many others, but it's not static. If you're going back to what was taught a thousand years ago or a hundred years ago or even last year, if you're not allowing your understanding to grow and be corrected and adjusted, then you have dropped out of the race. And that's the race that Paul referred to, that we're to strive to come in number one. We're to strive to, be, to win the gold prize. And that would be to become the bride. And according to Julie, the bride has all but been chosen already. But those individuals who are the bride don't necessarily know who they are yet. That leads me to a, an idea. Hopefully I'll pack this all into a half an hour. Uh, Jeff Byerly, some time ago, he left me with a challenge. Well, he left everyone with a challenge. One of the messages the Lord gave him uh, in reference to the, the, the length of times that are mentioned in both Daniel and Revelation. One of them is 1260 days, one is 1335, and one is 1290. He reported a message from the Lord that said, uh, if you want to know what these days mean, why don't you ask me? And so uh, I've of course, I'm like many, I have wanted to know what these days mean, but I uh, don't know if I've ever specifically asked the Lord to show them to me. So I did, and immediately came up with some ideas. Doesn't mean I got it right, but I will just pass along quickly what I came up with. I didn't come up with anything for 1290, but it could be very similar to the 1260 and the 1335. The Revelation that's coming out of the prophets, the modern day prophets, is that the bride is picked early on in the tribulation. And this is me speaking now, and I believe that I am one of the Lord's servants. Whether you'd call me a prophet, I think I'm a watchman. It's very similar, but uh, one of the things that's becoming more and more of a consensus that this 144,000 picked from the tribes of Israel, the two houses, the house of Judah, who are the Jewish people, and the house of Israel, who are, are the Christians. Just like Yeshua said, I came only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That he's picking this 144,000 out of the descendants of the 12 tribes of Israel. 13, if you... If you add Levi, and then of course, most people have noticed Dan is not included in the tribes from which the bride comes from. Anyway, back to the numbers. It appears, and I went through this in an earlier episode when I'm comparing the Exodus, which is a prophecy of the tribulation that happened on the 50th Jubilee of time. We are now at the 120th Jubilee of time. And this is the second and the greater exodus, the fulfillment of the prophecy. So when you examine that, you find that the bride and the groom were married at year three, and just within that year, so anywhere in that third year. So when I said three and a half fits, halfway through that third year, the bride who was uh, depicted by Zipporah, and the groom who was depicted by Moses were married at three year three and a half, I'm going to propose. It was on the third year, so during that year. And uh, 
This matches with the book of Revelation where the, the in in Revelation 12 where the first woman that's referred to is protected and nurtured for 1260 days. That's a three and a half year period. The the Jubilee year started, and I've taught this uh, in many ways, in many episodes, so I would encourage anyone that's wanting to learn these things, go back and go where the Lord leads you. I'm at episode 181 today. Uh, the, the Jubilee starts on the Day of Atonement, which was a few days ago on um, October 3rd. And that's using Enoch's calendar, which is God's calendar. So I guess it's not Enoch's calendar, it's God's calendar. Reported by Enoch, which neither the Jews nor the Christians use. So three and a half, 1260 days from the Day of Atonement, which is the 10th day of the 7th month, puts us at the 10th day of the first month, three and a half years later, which is Lamb Selection Day which is the day that Yeshua rode triumphantly through the streets of Jerusalem and was praised by the people and set the, the Jewish leaders' hearts ablaze with, with jealousy and envy and indignation. It rose Satan up within them to fight back, and they had him dead within uh, five days. The Passover, well, four days later was the Passover, and he was dead by the end of the day and then rose three days later on the Feast of First Fruits. So you can see how each one of God's appointed times has a very specific meaning, purpose, and we will receive that revelation when we start observing it. This is important. You don't just think they're great or think they're a good idea or listen to the teachings on them. You observe them today. October 8th is the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And a few days ago, October 3rd, was the Day of Atonement, the day we fast. And then you back up another week and a half was the, the Feast of Trumpets. And uh, up until this point, it was taught that that's the, the time of the wedding, but it is not. It appears now that the time of the wedding is in the spring, three and a half years later uh, from the start of the tribulation. And I uh, lost my, my train there, but uh, it does point, the Feast of Trumpets does point to the return of Christ with his bride. But the bride was married to him at the beginning of the tribulation, at the year three and a half. So, uh, in this theology, what I'm saying to you is that the tribulation started a year ago on the Day of Atonement. So year one has just been passed. The wedding will occur in two and a half years on the 10th day. You know, that's my current <laughs> speculation. And then what's the 1335? Well, uh, I have taught how to find the Feast of Weeks, and it falls in a range of days because, well, you have to go back and it would take too long to explain it all, but you have to take the signs from the moon and the sun into account to find the Feast of Weeks because you're counting seven weeks from the Feast of First Fruits, the day Yeshua rose from the, from the dead. And it'll end up in a range number of days but 1335 fits in that range so I'm going to propose that that uh, the bride some of the the members will come into awareness of who they are at 1260 some will come into awareness at 1290 and then the balance all the remaining ones will come into awareness who they are at 1335 days uh, after the beginning of the tribulation which was a year ago and just like i said in my um, teaching going back on uh, part one i still haven't got part two that uh, 
Oh, lost my train of thought. It'll come back to me. So anyway, let's put that on hold till it comes back to me. Let's talk a little bit about these fall feasts very quickly. I want to focus on the Day of Atonement because uh, there's some things in there that are pretty remarkable that I learned maybe about a year ago, but I went through it again. And uh, So again, uh, the Feast of Trumpets pictures the time that Christ will return. It's, in my estimation, the most likely time he was born on the Feast of Trumpets. When you look at all the the uh, information found in the four testimonies I, of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and it will be the day he comes with his bride, of course, and establishes his rule for a thousand years. That's the day the evil armies that surround Jerusalem for the last time are defeated. And you read that in the book of Zechariah. Everything but the first two verses are this event of Yeshua's return. The first two verses are the judgment that's coming upon Jerusalem very, very soon. At the beginning of the tribulation, we will see armies of enemy of all the enemies of Israel surrounding Jerusalem very, very soon. And at the same time, we'll see the judgment come upon the United States and Canada. And that's found in Zechariah 6, 1 to 8. And Canada is that nation to the north where God's spirit finds rest. So some amazing things are going to happen here in Canada. And I think specifically here in Saskatchewan. No, let's back this up. I know I got a lot of thoughts that aren't complete. So that's the picture of the Feast of Trumpets. The Day of Atonement is very obviously a time of judgment and searching within the soul of preparation for judgment. Uh, it's the only uh, appointed time that we fast. We don't eat or drink water for a 24-hour period. Well, close to a 24-hour period, from sunset to sunset. The days are getting shorter and shorter at this time of year in the Northern Hemisphere, so it's less than 24 hours. So uh, that would be very likely the point towards the time that the, the nations are judged. As soon as Yeshua sits on his throne, he will set the, judge, the judgment of the nations, he will separate the sheep from the goats. Now I'm going to just take a little bit of time. I'm running out of time here to talk about the Day of Atonement. If you go to Leviticus 16, you'll see that there's a what always seemed to me a bit of an odd ceremony that God had the priests take everyone through. The, the two goats were chosen and one was, was assigned to be for the Lord and one was assigned to be uh, the Azazel goat. Now, uh, until I read the book of Enoch, this didn't make lots of sense. It made a little bit of sense what was going on and who was who and what was what. Azazel is the one, and you'll find it in Enoch, the book of Enoch again. I believe it's chapter 8. And I should have prepped here. Go to chapter 10, verse 8, makes this statement. The whole earth has been corrupted through the works that were taught by Azazel. To him assign all sin. So <laughs> that, now I'll fill in the pieces there. In the leading chapters here of Enoch, he describes the fall of the angels and their rebellion. There were about 100, 200, sorry, high-ranking angels that chose to rebel against God. Now, the revelation is that a third of all the angels, which is 10,000 times 10,000, sort of. I mean, it's a huge number, whatever that is, 100 million. A third of all the angels rebel. But these leaders chose to rebel against God. And just like I just read there, Azazel was the one who uh, was the ringleader, let's say. He's also the one that 
uh, taught men war, the making of military equipment. He's the warmonger. And he also taught the painting of the eyelids. Interestingly enough, so uh, I would speculate that means uh, the use of makeup and adorning the eyes. That, that was uh, for something that the fallen angels taught humans. Anyway, that's just a passing point of interest. Uh, well, the the thing about war is not a pet. that's very important anyway azazel is being assigned all sin so the lord is picking azazel as bearing the greatest uh, responsibility for leading this ring of people of people angels who rebelled against god these high ranking fallen angels and then there was many more under them that followed suit till a third of all the angels rebelled Anyway, uh, if you read that whole ceremony with the Zazal goat, it makes a whole lot of sense calling it a Zazal. And I suspect the, the goat that was for the Lord represented the Lamb of God. And, and I'm going to propose that the reason the goat was used, there was two goats. They looked identical and they were cast. Uh, they were picked by Lot. In other words, God picked them. And uh, what, it, what that means is, humanly speaking, we can't tell the difference between the angel of light, who Satan is, and the real McCoy, I was going to say, the, the, the real thing, who is Yeshua. And only the Spirit of God can reveal these things to us. And like it says, what uh, Yeshua said, that, uh, it, that even the elect would be deceived if that was possible. So the Lord makes it, through his grace, impossible for the elect to be deceived. Otherwise, we would be and will be. So only a constant life of repentance, humility, will keep us from being deceived. So if you're a proud person and you think you got it made, you got it all figured out, and you can't be taught things, you won't allow your theology to be adjusted, you won't allow people to talk about things you don't know yet, you just stick to your guns that what you learned 50 years ago was right, then you are being deceived. You are one of those who've bought into the message of the angel of light. Okay. Now we get to the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, I could probably spend another hour talking about the Feast of Tabernacles, but it uh, has historically been taught that it is celebration of the harvests. But I will point this out, that God has said this in the scriptures, that it's to remind us of living in tents in the wilderness. And again, that's pointing back to the Exodus. So the Exodus story is extremely important. It's a prophecy of what will happen during the Great Tribulation. And uh, I will eventually get to part two of how the Great Tribulation unfolds. But what is going to happen, according to the prophecy, is God is going to collect all the people that say they believe in God. Uh, going through this Great Tribulation, this terrible, terrible time when... Virtually everybody on earth is, dies, but the survivors will all be collected in one spot and they will be taken through the wilderness for 40 years. Now, I know that's a tough one to swallow, but I have gone through the eight proofs or evidences. So I go back in my teaching and the best one of them all is the counting of the seven sevens from the Feast of First Fruits to the Feast of Weeks, the creation of the Feast Fruits, First Fruits. And this last group, when you talk about the 1335 on the Feast of Weeks, is a prophetic view of the, of the uh, guests of the wedding. There's always three groups. So I'm going to say that the first group was pointed towards by the 1260 days, the, Second group is pointed towards by the 1290 days. 
And then the last group, the guests of the wedding, is pointed towards prophetically the uh, guests to the wedding. And that's who these people that, that make it through this last journey of 40 years through the desert, through the wilderness. And that is a prophetic. Um, I've used this scripture many, many times, and it should be a should be a memory scripture, but I'll put it in my description. Uh, where God says, I will take you out of the wilderness of the people. And that's the great tribulation. He's going to gather everybody who says they're a believer. Going to collect them all in one spot. And it appears to be South Africa. And he's going to take us, us or them, this final journey. And he says, I will march you under the shepherd's rod. In other words, he's going to do exactly what he did in the first exodus. He's going to require that they follow his teachings and instructions. That's the Torah. And he says, those who disobey me will never enter my land. So the indication is that only a tenth, well, a full tenth. I shouldn't say only because in the first one, only Caleb and Joshua made it. In this one, 10% of whoever this group is, let's say there's several million, many, many millions, they will, the ones who make it, the 10th that make it, will be the guests to the wedding. Anyway, that's speculative, and I'm over time, so this is Neil with Rock Our World.